So heat is the transfer of thermal energy between a system and a surroundings. That transfer is caused by a difference in temperature. What's temperature? Temperature is a measure of the thermal energy, the average kinetic energy of the particles within a sample. So heat will flow from matter that has a high temperature to matter that has a low temperature until they come to the same temperature and then it stops, right? So if you put ice cubes in your hot chocolate, the ice cubes are gonna warm up and melt, the hot chocolate is gonna cool down, but when they get to the same temperature, they stop. It doesn't keep going so that the ice cubes now start boiling and go into steam and the, the hot chocolate freezes, right? That doesn't happen. The transfer occurs until the temperature is the same. This is called thermal equilibrium. So there's no additional net transfer of heat. And so you know, if you think about it, um, the heat's flowing all the time from higher temperatures to lower temperatures. And at some point they predict that everything in the universe will come to the same temperature and then nothing will happen, right? So that would be the death of, of the universe, I guess. It's not gonna happen in your lifetime, don't worry. Okay, so when a system absorbs heat, its temperature changes, it goes up, right? So that's delta T, the change in the temperature. Well, how much does it increase in temperature? Well, it's gonna be proportional to how much heat was absorbed, right? Put more heat in, you get a bigger energy change. The proportionality constant there is called the heat capacity. And that's gonna have units of joules per degree Celsius. So we can say that the change in temperature is proportional to the amount of heat. So the heat capacity, that's the heat required to change the temperature of the system by one degree. The larger the heat capacity, the smaller the energy change. The, I'm sorry, the smaller the temperature rise will be. But that heat capacity also depends on the size of the system. Heat capacity is an extensive property. It depends on how big that sample is. That's not as useful. So what we use more frequently is called the specific heat capacity, C with a subscript S. And this is an intensive property. It's the intrinsic capacity of a substance to absorb heat. Um, we also see that heat capacity and specific heat capacity depend on the type of material that an object is, uh, cons consists of. So specific heat capacity, um, the amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. So the units here are joules divided by grams times degree Celsius. We can also talk about a molar heat capacity. And so here we're talking about per mole of substance instead of gram. The amount of heat needed to raise the temperature of one mole by one degree Celsius. So these are intensive properties. So the specific heat capaci capacity of iron is the same whether I have a little tiny piece of iron or I have a giant boulder of iron. The specific heat capacity is the same. So this is an equation that we're gonna be using a lot. Q equals MC delta T. So Q is the heat measured in joules. M is the mass of the system measured in grams. CS is the specific heat capacity measured in joules per gram degree Celsius. And delta T is the temperature change in degrees Celsius. So the specific heat capacity is not something that you need to memorize. You would look it up, or on an exam, you'd be given the value of it. And so here's a table that might be useful in homework and worksheet problems with specific heat capacities of several compounds. 
So we see here that um, for the metals, for most of these, the heat capacity is low. Um, if we look at compounds such as ethanol and water, we see that the, the specific heat capacity of water is significantly higher than the metals. And here we have glass, granite, and sand, and those are also relatively low compared to water. So we've got these variables, Q, M, C sub S, and delta T. And so if we know three of those, we can calculate the fourth. So water has a high specific heat capacity, which means that compared to other substance, it can absorb a lot of heat and the temperature only goes up a little bit compared to, say, concrete. You put the same amount of heat into concrete and it's going to get a lot hotter than the water does. So water has a moderating effect on our climate. This is a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge just, you know, about three hours to the west of us. And the temperature there is much more moderate than it is here, right? In San Francisco in the summer, it might be 68 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas here in Fresno, it might be 100 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. And that's not diff due to differences in longitude or latitude. I always forget which is which, um, how close we are to the equator, because we're approximately the same. The difference is that San Francisco is surrounded on three sides by a huge body of water, right? The ocean and the San Francisco Bay. So the sun comes, beats down on us during the day and warms the planet, right? So in the San Francisco area, the water is absorbing a lot of that energy and it doesn't change temperature as much as, say, the concrete on the bridge, right? Then at night, when the sun has set and is no longer providing energy, now the air gets cooler, and so energy is going to move from those things that heat it up, like the concrete and the water, into the air. Well, the concrete is going to cool down and release energy into the surroundings, into the air but it's not gonna release nearly as much as the water will because the water absorbed a lot of energy and then it can release it. And so it keeps the temperature from going too high during the day and from going too low at night. So, do I have that in there? No, I don't. Um, I, I lived near San Francisco for a while and the, the temperature there the, the change between day and night is often around 10 degrees. It might be like 68 during the day and 58 at night, right? And here in the valley, it might be 105 during the day and 65 at night, right? That's not unusual at all. Why? Because we live in the desert, right? We have no large bodies of water. We don't even have very much humidity in the air, right? So there's very little water to absorb and store that energy and then release it later. And so our temperatures go up and down like crazy. There's a lot of words in this problem. To determine whether a shiny gold colored rock is actually gold, a chemistry student decides to measure its heat capacity. She first weighs the rock and finds it has a mass of 4.7 grams. She then finds that upon absorption of 57.2 joules of heat, the temperature of the rock rises from 25 degrees Celsius to 57 degrees Celsius. Find the specific heat capacity of the substance composing the rock and determine whether the value is consistent with the rock being pure gold. Specific heat capacity is an intensive property. It can be used for identification. Density is also an intensive property. I don't know if you remember, a few chapters ago, we looked at um, a guy and his fiance, and they had this ring that was supposed to be platinum, but it turned out not to be platinum. Oh, yeah. yeah. And how did we do that one? We measured the density. It'd be a lot easier to measure the density of this piece of rock that we think might be gold 
but then that wouldn't be helpful to this chapter. So anyway, so what we want to do, we've read the problem. We want to pick out those numbers and write them down. So we have 4.7 grams. We have 57.2 joules. And we have two temperatures here, 25 degrees Celsius and 57 degrees Celsius. Here we're gonna be using an equation rather than dimensional analysis. The equation is Q equals MC delta T. Uh, the C delta T, that delta kind of looks like an A, so sometimes students say Q equals M cat. So this is the equation we're going to use. What are we trying to find? The specific heat capacity. So that's, that's the CS. That's what we're trying to find, right? So we could rearrange this equation. The specific heat capacity is equal to Q divided by the mass times the change in temperature. So let's identify what all these numbers are. 4.7 grams, is that heat, mass, or temperature? That's mass, so that's the mass of the rock. What about 57.2 joules? Is that heat, mass, or temperature? That's the heat. And then we have two temperatures here. What we want is delta T. Delta T means the final temperature minus the initial temperature. A change in temperature can be positive or negative. It can go up or go down. So from the context here, is 25 degrees the initial temperature or the final? Initial. It's the initial, because it went from 25 to 57. So that's our initial temperature, and this is our final temperature. So delta T then is the final temperature, 57, minus the initial temperature, 25, or 32 degrees Celsius was the change. I have my rearranged equation, and now I have M, Q, and delta T, so I can put those in here and calculate. You want to write the units here. So Q is 57.2 joules. And we're dividing by 4.7 grams. That's, that's a 4. Kind of looked like a 9. And the temperature change is 32 degrees Celsius. So 57.2 divided by the quantity, use parentheses, 4.7 times 32, close the parentheses, equals 0 0.3803. I'm looking at these numbers to figure out how many significant figures my final answer should have. I've got three and two and two. So that should have two sig figs. And then the units on this, I'm just going to look at the units that didn't cancel out. Well, nothing canceled out. So the units are joules per gram times degrees Celsius. Is that consistent with the rock being gold? I don't know. What's the specific heat capacity of gold? You don't know either. 
do we find out? Go look it up. So here, specific heat capacity of gold is 0.128. Is that rock gold? No, it's not. Now, it's close to copper of 0.385. Does that mean it is copper? No, not necessarily. If it was gold, though, it would be this. And because it isn't, it's not gold. So the answer to this would be it's not gold. This is a number you have to come up with to answer the question, but it's not the answer to the question. Let's do another example. A 55 gram aluminum block initially at 27.5 degrees Celsius absorbs 725 joules of heat. What is the final temperature of the aluminum? Well, let's highlight those numbers. We got 55 grams, we got this temperature, we got that joules. And it's asking us what the final temperature is. So I've got 55.0 grams, I've got 27.5 degrees Celsius, 725 joules. We've got something changing temperatures. We're talking about heat. We're going to use that Q equals MC delta T equation. So the 55 grams represents which of these variables? M. Is this the change in temperature? 27.5? No, it's the initial temperature, isn't it? That's what it started at. What's the final temperature? Well, that's what we're trying to find. Right? Tf equals, I don't know. And then what's the 725 joules? Is that the heat capacity or the heat? It's the heat, Q. So this equation doesn't have T final in it specifically does it. It has delta T. But we've got M and Q. Where are we going to get C sub S? We're going to look it up. Let's go look it up. Aluminum 0.903. Down here, 0.903. So C sub S. 0.903 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So I've got M, I've got Q, I've got C sub S. So I've got everything here except delta T. If I found delta T and I know the initial temperature, I could figure out what the final temperature is. So I'm going to rearrange this equation to solve for delta T. Um, some of you are still having some issues rearranging equations like this. I expect that, but I want to help you. And so you know who you are if you're getting problems wrong because you're, you're rearranging the equation wrong. Come and talk to me and we'll figure it out, okay? I can also show you some tricks on your calculator to, uh, so you don't even have to rearrange them. Anyway, this is the rearrangement. So I'm going to plug my numbers in. I have Q is uh, 725 joules. Down here, I have the mass, 55 grams. I have the specific heat capacity with very messy units. What happens here is the joules cancel, 
and the grams cancel. So the unit I'm left with here is one over one over degrees Celsius, which is equal to degrees Celsius. So if I do the math, 725 divided by the quantity 55 times 0.903. Oops, I got a little off there. So the change in temperature is equal to 14.598 degrees Celsius, uh, 3333C figs. So we can, we can find out TF by thinking about it or by using a math equation. Because that's going to equal the final temperature minus the initial temperature. We know what the initial temperature is, right? The initial temperature is 27.5. So if I add 27, I'm sorry, 25, I said it right and I wrote it wrong. How do I do that? 27, my hand doesn't know what my mouth is saying. So I'm gonna take my 14.598 and I'm gonna add 27.5, except I pushed the wrong button. 14.598 plus 27.5. 42 0 0.098 42.1 degrees Celsius. If you don't like equations like that, we can think about it. We started at 27. The change in temperature is positive. That means the temperature is going up. So I'm going to add this to the original temperature to get my final temperature. If delta T was negative, the temperature is going down. And so I would subtract the change to get the lower temperature. Any questions? Yes. Yes, you could. You could, because you could write it like this. Mass times the specific heat capacity times T final minus T initial. And you could solve for T, and T final it. My experience is that when you do this, now you have to distribute when you're multiplying. And that just adds one more layer of potential issues, right, into the math. But yeah, you can absolutely do that. Any other questions?